Amen. It is because of that amazing love, that amazing grace, that we are even able to gather as his children in the wonderful name of our God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. Jesus being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion. Jesus has risen from the dead. He has given him dominion over the works of his hands. Indeed, today 
as we, at the beginning of our service this morning, acknowledge that we are sinful human beings. And so we confess our sin to God, our merciful Father. Almighty God, maker of all things, judge of all people, I admit and confess my sinfulness. I am by nature sinful, and I have not always lived as your thankful and joyful child. I have turned away from you in my thinking, speaking, and doing. I have done the evil you forbid and have not done the good you demand. I repent and am truly sorry for my sins. Have mercy on me, gracious Father. Forgive me all that has passed. Blot out my sins and with the power of the Holy Spirit, direct my life so that I serve you in true faithfulness. Through Jesus Christ, my Lord. The good news, my friends, is this. That God has promised forgiveness of sins to those who repent and turn to him. May he keep you in his grace by the Holy Spirit and, and grant you a victorious life here on earth and a triumphant life with him in heaven forever. And so as a called and ordained servant of Jesus, it is with joy that I share with you the good news, that I forgive you of all your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. As well-loved Easter people, rejoice and be glad. You are free indeed. Amen. Even in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes reign. O Lord, my God, I cry to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and it will be forever. And so as brothers and sisters, let's pray, shall we? Living Lord, you have commanded us to preach repentance and forgiveness of sin to all nations. To fulfill this command, we ask you to clothe us with the power from on high, your Holy Spirit, that we may carry the amazing message of your resurrection to the ends of the earth, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated, and if the kids can come on up, because I have a special project today. If you want to partake, come on up. How you doing today? That, you scared me over there. I didn't see you. We got some noisy offering. Woo woo! Sounds cool. Hello, Samantha. How are you? That's good. Michael, how are you doing today? Candy and Chloe. Hello again. <laughs> okay, I brought some paper. Oh, and a pen. Thank you, Michael. I put paper in a pen. Kind of. Kind of. Kind of. You know, we've been using a word a lot, and it's just the first, what, five, ten minutes of worship? We've been using a word a lot. Actually, three words. Forgiveness of sins. Can you say forgiveness of sins? Oh, you guys got that down, yeah. We've been talking a lot about forgiveness of sins. And you know, in the first reading, we're going to hear about forgiveness of sins. And in the sermon, we're going to hear about forgiveness of sins. And it's kind of one of those phrases 
that you learn more about Sunday school as you get older in confirmation, and as you get older into adulthood. You learn all about that, but you guys can understand forgiveness of sins because it just starts with two words. I'm sorry. Can you say that? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Now, you know, when I was your age, and yes, I was your age one time, Samantha. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Okay. Yeah. You're trying to think what I was like at your age? Mm, don't think about that. I was trying to get you to think that I was surprised. Oh, yeah. I was once your age, many, 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 many years ago. Anyway, we did something in church that I will never forget. And that was your guy's age. And I'll never, ever forget it. What we did... We were the pastor was talking about forgiveness. His name was Pastor Kofer, C-O-F-E-R, okay? And he had us take a piece of paper and a pen and write down, God, I am sorry for dot, dot, dot. Can you say dot, dot, dot? dot, dot. Okay. Okay. And what we had to do was, it was put down what we're sorry for. Now, maybe... You know, we said something really bad to our sister or our brother, or maybe we didn't listen to mom and dad, or whatever it was. We wrote it down on the piece of paper. And then what we did, we took that paper, and we folded it up, and we brought it up front to church, and we gave it to Jesus. But here's the neat thing, Michael. What we did was we nailed it to the cross. Now, I'm not going to do that here because there are a couple of adults that wouldn't be happy with me if I got a hammer and nails out and nailed it to the cross. But did you notice when you came up, there was papers on the floor by that cross? That's these papers from the first service. So, what we're going to do, if you want to do it, you don't have to do it, that's okay. If you want to do it, I'm going to give you a piece of paper. And there's a pen back of the pews. Your mom and dad might have a pencil or a pen type of thing. And I would like you to write on here, Dear God, I am sorry for dot, dot, dot. Okay? And fill in the blank. Now, this is just between you and God. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even show it to mom and dad. Between you and God, Okay? And then you fold it up. Now, if you want to, sometime during the service, come up and lay them down at the bottom of the cross. And what we're going to do is at the end of worship, I'm going to have a special prayer down by these. And I'm going to ask God to forgive all those sins and show you the joy of forgiveness and absolution, okay? Okay. And then, I'm not going to read them, mm -mm, because they're between you and God, right? You're sorry to God. So I'm going to take these outside, I'm going to burn them, so nobody sees it but God. And so they're removed forever and ever and ever, because God says, I forgive you. And then I'm going to take those ashes, and I'm going to sprinkle them in the ground of the church. And your sins are going to be totally forgiven and to be found no more. They're going to be wiped out. Can you say, wiped out? Wiped out. Wiped out. So, if you want to, okay, you can do this. And if you want to write something down and fold it and put it in your pocket, that's okay. But if you want to bring it up, any time during the service, come on up, lay it down there before the end of service. Sound cool? Because today is all about knowing that we are forgiven. Say, we are forgiven. We are forgiven. Amen, amen. So, let's pray, and then I'll give you the piece of paper, and we'll take it from there. So, let's pray. Ready? Hands up. One, two, three. Oh, dear God, we thank you that we can come together and worship and praise, but also to come to you and say we're sorry for all those things that, that we didn't do or the things we did wrong or for the sins in our lives and... Thank you, Jesus, that we can come to you and just say, I'm sorry. And we hear the words from you, 
I forgive you. Thank you, Jesus, that you forgive us and that you love us so much that you died for us. And as we lay our sins before your cross today and we say we're sorry, help us to hear the words, you are forgiven, my child. I love you so much. So thank you, God, for forgiving all our sins that they're wiped out to be remembered no more. Thank you, God. In you we pray, amen. So, um, who do we need here? Um, can you do me a flavor? During the offering, if you want to grab dad, with, I know, I always say do me a flavor. Can you do me a flavor? Maybe you can do it with your dad if you want. During the offering, if you can come up, maybe with your dad or the usher, and bring the noisy offering up to the altar. Can you do it? Thank you, dear. All right. If you want to do, here's a piece of paper. And if you just, Chloe, if you just want to draw a picture and give it to God, you can do that too. That's okay. And here's, oh, you know, it's a man to the ready. There's one for you, my dear. And we need two down there for you guys. I'm um, coming to you, Michael. Yep. Thank you. Can you share that? Dan? Thank you, thank you, thank you. And one for you. How many more are there? There's two more. You know what? Three. Three more. I'm going to take this one. And you know what? Since there's two more, you want to give them to somebody? Okay, give them to somebody. All right, guys. Again, if you want to, write something down. Put it by the cross. We'll pray. God said, so forgive you, and we move on. Sounds good? Sounds good, guys. Thanks for coming up. Have a great day. Don't forget, Connie, if you bring the offering up during the offering, that'll be great. Thanks, guys. You okay, Connie? There you go. And sermon text comes from Acts 3, verses 11 through 21. While the lame man who is now healed clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's, astounded. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate. And when he had decided to release him, but you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead, to this we are witnesses, and his name, by faith, his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. The faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers, but what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer and thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading comes from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1-7. through 7. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. 
You know that he appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. This is the word of the Lord. If you are so able, please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. And the Holy Gospel this morning is according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I, myself, touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it before him. Then he said to them, These are my words that I've spoken to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses to these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Yeah, can 
you that you are amazing. You're indescribable, uncontainable. Father, we just thank and praise you that you are amazing. Your love is amazing. Your forgiveness is amazing. Be with us now and bless us as we hear your words, especially of forgiveness of sins. In you we do pray. Amen. Indeed, God is amazing. In the book of Acts, one of my favorite books it begins with a commission and it begins with a promise. And these are the words in the beginning of the book of Acts. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and all Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Wow. A commission and a promise. Now, the rest of Acts, the rest of the book of Acts, shows how God carries that out. And today's first reading that you heard Billy just read demonstrates how Peter once again fulfilled his commission as a witness, following a demonstration of divine power, the healing of a lame beggar at the beautiful gate of the temple. Now, our reading is the immediate consequence of that healing of Peter, of this lame man. Now, a little bit of background on this lame man. This beggar, this lame beggar, was very familiar uh, to those who came to the temple. He was lame from birth. 
And now he's probably around age 40. So for 40 years, he was laying on the ground at the beautiful gate of the temple. And now being lame, he had to be carried in and carried out of the temple. Now keep that image in your head. And imagine you're standing there day in and day out, seeing this man being carried in and carried out. But now, all of a sudden, he's leaping for joy. And he's clinging to Peter and to John. So naturally, the, the people rushed to see what was happening. And so Peter told them what happened. And this miracle sets off a whole series of events that take us all the way to chapter 4, verse 31. And it includes the first persecution of the post-Easter followers of Jesus Christ. Now, going back to the temple for a second, the temple authorities arrested Peter and John. And now they appear be, before the council. And they're let go with a, I don't want to say a slap on the wrist, but they're let go with a warning. But Peter used this miracle and his arrest as an occasion to witness to the resurrected Jesus. In fact, Peter and John's interrogation before the Sanhedrin yields this timeless testimony. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And this whole sequence ends with these two apostles, Peter and John, reporting to their friends. And they pray for continued boldness, a prayer that God answers by shaking the place and by granting their request. They continue to speak the word of God with boldness. I love that. They didn't stop. They continued, and they continued with boldness. <coughs> Sorry, and this text <coughs> is the first part of Peter's sermon to the assembled crowd immediately following this miracle. And these verses, the one you just, just heard, complete what he had already said, that Jesus is the one foretold by Moses and the prophets who would come to rescue both Jews and Gentiles from their sins. But first, let's go back to the miracle, right? Miracles sure do attract crowds, right? Whether 2024 or back with Peter and John, miracles sure do attract crowds. So a crowd is beginning to gather because of the miracle of this lame beggar who's now up and leaping for joy. Because what had happened was Peter and John healed this lame man, again, 40-ish. He healed him. And wow, everybody came running. Everybody. Now imagine back then, they didn't have cell phones and they text each other. No, no, it was word of mouth. Peter and John did this miracle, and everybody came running. What do you mean this 40-year-old is now up and jumping and leaping for joy? What do you mean? They came running. And who wouldn't? I would too. And I'm guessing you would join me. An amazing thing happened. Really impressive. But in Peter's sermon that followed, an amazing thing also took place. And actually, if I dare say, 
something that was more amazing than the actual miracle, if that's possible. God offered the forgiveness of sins to those who killed the author of life. Hold that thought for a second. Let's really dive into this for a second. The words, you killed the author of life. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus, who was, or better, is God himself, who became true man in order to save us. And in his ministry, what did he do? He helped people. He healed their diseases. He cast out their demons. He raised their dead. He forgave their sins, especially, the gospel writers said, the sins of the tax collectors and sinners and those who ate with Jesus, those really sinful people. He forgave their sins. So here's the, here's the question. Did Jesus do anything to deserve death? The answer is no. Absolutely nothing. And if you remember just a few weeks ago, Good Friday, even Pilate knew that he was innocent. And he planned to release Jesus because he knew he was innocent. So what happened? Well, the leaders, they were jealous and, and they resented Jesus' rebuke about their pride and their hypocrisy. To them, he was a menace. He was a menace to their positions and, and their power. And so according to them, Jesus had to go. What about the people? Not just the leaders. Well, if you think back to Palm Sunday, they hailed Jesus as a hero, but just in a few short days, they were screaming out for his death. Crucify him! And here's the big thing. They had a choice, remember? They had a choice. Jesus or Barabbas. And they chose Barabbas, a murderer, instead of Jesus, the author of life. They wanted Jesus dead. And in the end, they got what they wanted. Jesus dead. Or so they thought. And that's why Peter here in his sermon, he says to these people, you killed the author of life. Now I know as a Lutheran Christian, we don't rank sins from one to a hundred. I know that, I get that. But I really can't imagine a worse sin than killing the author of life. Adam and Eve, they chose to eat a piece of fruit. And that doesn't seem so bad as crucifying the Son of God. So if anybody deserved hell, it was those people to whom Peter was preaching to, because they killed the author of life. And here's the amazing thing about this whole story. Instead of delivering God's curse, what does Peter say? Repent, therefore. Tell God you're sorry, just as the kids are doing on their papers. Repent and turn back, that your sin may be blotted out. Or well, the word I use with the kids, wiped out. Just like those papers with those sins listed this afternoon will be burned. Blotted out. Wiped out. Erased. Gone for good. That's forgiveness, my friends. That our sins are gone for good. Repeat that with me. Our sins are what? 
God for good. Absolutely. Forgiveness for their sin or, or any sin is only possible because of one reason. God. The only reason. When Adam and Eve sinned, and all of us followed right along with them, God acted to save. His mercy and his love and his forgiveness are greater than the sin of Peter's hearers, you killed the author of life. Even the sin of, of killing God's son. We receive mercy and love because they are greater than our sins. And not only did he promise, starting with Adam and Eve, that he would save us sinners, but he kept his promise. He sent Jesus, who died, and on the third day rose again to secure our forgiveness. Jesus is the great sin bearer of all our sins. That's why I invited the kids, if they wanted to, invite the kids to lay their sins at the cross and ask God for forgiveness. Because Jesus is a great sin bearer. He's a great death dyer. He has died our death, our punishment. But when he rose from the grave, he won. Not sin, not death, and not the devil. But Jesus won. Amen. Sin had been wiped out. And that's exactly what Peter was offering to even those who killed Jesus, the author of life. The very worst sin that we can think of was completely wiped out and conquered by the cross of Jesus Christ. And we know that. And we get that. But you know, here, here's the thing. Don't we often hold at least one sin back? And here's what I'm talking about. Have you ever thought or said to yourself, I get it that, that, that God forgives sins. I, I get that. But there are there's a sin in my life that I think is just way too big for God to forgive. Have you ever had that moment? There are many of us, maybe all of us, who, who have or, or had a sin that, that we thought was too big to forget. Never mind for God to forgive. And so we, we hold on to that because we don't think God can, can forgive that. And perhaps it's, it's something really embarrassing. Maybe it's something that, that's really scandalous that nobody knows about except us. Maybe it's something we just can't forget. Maybe it's a reoccurring sin that we do over and over and over again. You know, it's sins like this that we hold on to, that we don't think God can forgive, that trouble us, that haunt us, that refuse to leave us alone, leave us wondering, does God really forgive sin? Can God really forgive this big sin? And what do we do? We hold on to it instead of giving it to God to let go and let God. Can God even forgive that sin that we think is unforgivable? Absolutely. There's no sin too big to forgive. Even if we never forget that sin, that sin is never too big for God to forgive. He says, lay it at the feet of my cross. Laid at my son's feet because my son died for that sin. He died for all sins, but he especially died for the sin that you think that God can't forgive. 
Think of that for a moment. Do you have that one sin right now in your heart, in your mind, in your life that you're holding on to because you don't think God can forgive that sin? As you ponder your answer, let me throw this at you. Remember King David? God forgave King David. He was an adulterer. He was a murderer. Remember Paul? Remember who he was before Paul? He was who? Saul. He persecuted Christians. Remember Peter? He denied he knew Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. And guess what? It was this same Peter who held out forgiveness from God to restore all those people who killed the author of life. So Peter, who knew that God could forgive the biggest sin in his life, again, we don't rank sins, but he knew that God could forgive the biggest sin in his life, denying Jesus, tells these people, you killed the author of life. But repent. Say you're sorry. And God forgives. Yeah, sure, they killed Jesus. They killed the author of life. But the good news is, Jesus didn't say dead. No. Because Easter came. And Easter is God's answer to sin. Your answer, my answer, all of our answer. And there's a lot of it. There's a lot of gospel going on. Because the whole world was full of sin. Just open the paper, turn on TV, open your eyes. The world was full of sin. But God forgives sin. There's something greater than our sin. And that's Jesus Christ. God Almighty, the gracious and awesome God, the amazing God, has entered the world as Jesus, as a baby to redeem us, to die for us, to rise again for us, to blot out our sins, to wipe them away as far as the east is from the west. And that, my friends, is really amazing. To know that when we come to God and just say those simple words that a three-year-old could say, I'm sorry. We hear the voice of God saying to us, you're forgiven. My son died for you. That is really amazing. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. So now I'm in the peace of God that goes far above our human understanding. May you keep all our hearts and all our minds in the love of our amazing God who forgives our sins as far as the east is from the west to be remembered no more. Thank you, Jesus. In you we pray. Amen.
This morning at the 9 o'clock service, we had a couple of people put in some prayer requests. I'd like to share them and add them to our prayers this morning before we come to God in prayer. Um, as you see by the bulletin and the flowers, uh, we give thanks to God on behalf of Greg and Lisa, who celebrate 24 years of marriage. Uh, also in our prayers, uh, uh, one of our young kids uh, asked that we keep her great-grandmother, uh, Darlene Hyman, uh, in our prayers. Uh, she's dealing with pneumonia. And also a husband of one of our members, uh, John Darling, uh, is experiencing some medical things in his life right now. And we add him to our prayers that God will bless him uh, with healing as well. So if you please rise and join me in a time of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for the church that we may be bold to share the message not only of salvation, but of forgiveness of sins. Help us, dear Lord, to call all to repentance through the power of the Holy Spirit, that all may turn from their ways in, the, in forgiveness and contrition and hear the awesome words of absolution. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for this great nation and our country's leadership. We pray for our president and vice president, our governor, our mayor, and all our elected leaders. And we pray for all governments around the world, that they be a source of blessing to those they govern, and that oppression and strife and hatred in any form be hindered and eliminated and bring a sense of security, of peace, and well-being in our world today. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we pray for all those who serve us in their callings as first responders. We especially raise up before you the police officers, the firefighters, the EMT, and all the other emergency personnel. Father, we also keep in our prayers all our military personnel, those who are stationed here and those who are deployed abroad. Bless them and keep them safe as they defend our nation in challenging times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we raise up to you all those with special needs, whether it be for healing, or comfort, or presence, or anything, Lord, we just raise them to you. And Father, we pray this day for Darlene, who is dealing with pneumonia. We pray for John as, as he's dealing with his medical issues as well. We rejoice with Greg and Lisa as they celebrate 24 years of marriage. We pray for Rick Snyder, Terry Keeper, for Michelle Carpenter, who's about to go undergo surgery. For Wade Frau Higger and Tori Brinkerhoff, for Barr Barnett and Mick Elmer, for Joe Streeter and Shirley Hardesty, for Brecken and Avonlea Brannock, and all those we name in our hearts before you, dear Lord, be with them and bless them all. Lord, in your mercy, gracious Father, we know you hear our prayers and you answer them not according to what we want, but according to thy will. And so, Father, we pray all these petitions to you because it was you who have called us to pray with the words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Anybody? Anybody? Dear Heavenly Father, as your children had written down their hearts today and ask you to forgive whatever they have written down in this paper, we pray, dear Lord, to help them to realize that they 
have been truly forgiven. That they can live joyful lives, knowing that their sins have been forgiven, removed as far as the east is from the west, and as these papers will be burned this afternoon, so are those sins to be found no more. Help them to realize the joy of that forgiveness, the joy of the absolution, to hear the words from you, you, my child, are forgiven. I love you. Go and sin no more. So thank you, Jesus, for this awesome forgiveness, because you are amazing. Thank you, Father. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you in favor and always bless you with his peace, love, joy, and forgiveness. Amen.
believe in the resurrection and he's coming back he's coming back
guys. For not practicing them at all, we got through it. Yes, we did. Yeah, I honestly, I got to chat about that yesterday, but I was so busy yesterday. I didn't even know what to Thank you. 